Yannick Rice Lamb, a professor of journalism at Howard University and co-founder of FierceForBlackWomen.com. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to the chair of the Department of Media, Journalism and Film, Professor Ingrid Sturgis. Welcome everyone, welcome. It's so great to have you all here for this important conversation. We're hearing from voices that aren't always heard in the discussion around 9-11. Um, when I think about the 20 years since 9-11, I always go back to that day. It was a glorious uh, fall day, balmy weather. It was just beautiful. And I was taking a walk in the park and it just happened to be my birthday. And when I went back upstairs to uh, get ready for work, I was shocked by the conversation that was being held by Tabitha Smiley and Tom Joyner talking about something that I couldn't even imagine. And when I turned on the television, um, everything was shattered. And so from that day, everybody's had to deal with it and reckon with what happened on 9-11. We've all been changed by it. We've all had family and friends impacted by it, either as um, in their work, their place of work, or in their personal lives. So I welcome you to listen to this great conversation from some of the people who covered it and have li lived to tell the tale. So welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. Thank you, Professor Sturgis. As she mentioned, we have a stellar lineup today. Our Reporting While Black series features black journalists, who cover major stories. Some sessions highlight special issues that these journalists face on the job because of their race and ethnicity. For example, last year we had some sessions dealing with covering the protests where some journalists were arrested even though they showed their, their news credentials. So our lineup today includes Sonia Ross, Clem Richardson, Melanie Eversley, Keith Alexander, Jennifer Thomas, and Hazel Trice Edney. So at 8.53, the first plane crashed into one of the towers at the World Trade Center. At 9.09, .09, the second plane crashed into the second tower. Independent journalist Clem Richardson was a columnist at the New York Daily News on 9-11. As in many newsrooms, it was all hands on deck that day. Clem was based in the Brooklyn Bureau near the Brooklyn Bridge, which was choked with thousands of frantic people fleeing lower Manhattan. In addition to being a columnist and author, Clem has worked as a reporter, editor, and special projects writer at six newspapers, including the New York Daily News, the Anderson Independent, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Miami Herald, the Chicago Sun-Times, and New York Newsday. He has written thousands of articles and hundreds of columns, many of them for major stories such as 9-11 and the Atlanta child murders. He was featured in the Showtime documentary, Atlanta's Missing and Murdered, The Lost Children. He is a two-time winner of the New York City Press Club's Heart of New York Award and received the New York Association of Black Journalists 2014 Lifetime Achievement Award. Gowanus, A Love Story is his first novel. He is also an Aikido expert. Clem, thanks for joining us today and please let us know what your experiences were on 9-11. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be here amongst uh, just this stellar panel. I mean, it's funny, I know most the people here and I've heard about the rest of you. So thank you so much for being here. I took this screenshot um, behind me. So as you can see, that's the Freedom Center right over my right shoulder. I guess it's my left from where you are. And um, that's the view from my roof. Um, on the morning of 9-11, I was a local columnist here at the Daily News. And um, it, was, it was never all hands on deck for me originally because I was on my own time. All I had to do is produce the column and no one cared what I did in between. But I woke up and I was listening, as always, as every reporter, you listen to 1010 Wins or whatever news station is on your local news to find out if there's anything happening that you need to know. And uh, I remember um, the reporter was talking about uh, the towers of uh, smoking and, and uh, smoke coming out. And I thought that the um, they were some anniversary for the 1990 attack. Remember when they blew up the, um, the uh, bomb in the basement there at the World Trade Center? Well, I, um, I went to the roof and I stood uh, there looking in the view behind me. I saw this woman, by the way, to the left. She passed me at the Brooklyn Bridge, but we'll get to that. Um, 
I went to, uh, I w when I was up there and realized that this thing was going on, papers were falling on my roof. I literally, um, office papers, um, Dr. was just, just raining down. That's how much the wind and the smoke had taken so much of the dust and everything down, all down Brooklyn, um, uh, across the, um, the Hudson, all the way down to Staten Island. And if anyone, if you've been here, you know how long that is. I called in and they told me to go to Long Island College Hospital, which is between, again, uh, like over my, over my right shoulder, uh, between here and the towers. And I walked over there because nothing was moving, nothing was going on. I walked over there and um, we went to the emergency room. I went to the emergency room, met a photographer there to see if there's anything we could do, uh, and, you know, interview anyone. But no one came because they closed the Brooklyn Bridge. So there was a woman there. Uh, she was one of the receptionists in the emergency room. And she said her husband worked on the 80 something floor and he hadn't called her, but he always called her in the morning at around 9, 30, 10 o'clock. He always called her. So she and I walked over uh, down. And by that time, the second tower, had cooked, the first tower had collapsed and then the second tower collapsed. And we walked to the foot of the Brooklyn Bridge and stood there as this just trove of, I mean, the endless line of dusty people, some in amazing, you know, you could tell uh, shell shock. Some folks are really um, just getting by. I remember, strangely enough, there was a guy on a Segway, where they were on those um, scooters just coming down with everybody. And we just stood there and waited and waited and, and he never came. Uh, it, was, it was a very, you know, like, like I think some, before we started, someone mentioned that you don't know the, these historical events are going on because you're all focused and you're getting your job done. And that was what I thought at the time is just get the job done, just talk to people, get, to, get, get the stories, find out what happened, what happened to them, how they were doing, all that stuff. And I always thought up until last week that it had little effect on me, but I saw the National Geographic special. 9-11 um, um, a day, I think, I forgot, I forgot the exact title, 9-11 a day in, in history or something like that. But afterward, I, I felt the, the PTSD and you realized, I remembered how I felt. It was a difficult time. It was a difficult time and I'm glad I got to go through it, uh, to be here in New York, to be a part of such a, a historic story. But it's just really, really it will come to you as you watch that show or you watch anything now about it, it comes again, just how difficult it was and how fortunate uh, we were that casualties were not worse and the whole situation was not worse. And that's it, Yannick, I'll spit it back to you because I don't want to take up too much time. Okay. Thank you, Clem. At 9.31, President Bush called this an apparent terrorist attack. And then at 9.43 a.m., a plane crashed into the Pentagon. Award-winning journalist Hazel Trice Edney, founder of the Trice Edney Newswire, was the Washington correspondent for the National Newspaper Publishers Association and was on the scene at the Pentagon where she watched the billowing smoke and fire from the strike and interviewed evacuated employees. Edney, a 25-year veteran of the black press, served as Washington correspondent for the NNPA News Service for seven years, and then as NNPA's editor-in-chief for three years. Edney started her newspaper career with the Richmond Afro-American newspaper, working as a staff writer for eight years. She completed a master's degree at the Harvard University John F. Kennedy School of Government and a one-year congressional fellowship. Her Trice Edney Newswire is the first and only news service launched by an African-American woman. She also shares her expertise as a professor at Howard University. Thank you. Welcome, Hazel. Please share. Thank you so day. much. Thank you. Well, in order to share my 9-11 experience, I've got to back up a few days um, before because my 9-11 experience actually started in Durban, South Africa, where I was covering the World Conference Against Racism, Discrimination, and Xenophobia. If you remember the back and forth between whether Colin Powell was going to be allowed to come, um, whether they were gonna send a delegation at all. Well, in Durban, I found myself in the midst of a huge, huge protest march against America. Palestinians, um, 
people from other nations were protesting against my country. And there was one sign in particular that I remember, and that was the blood of our children are on the hands of George Bush. And at that time it was H.W. Bush uh, was in office. Well, fast forwarding, when I came home on that Friday, it was Friday, September 7th, that morning at around six o'clock, as the plane lowered down over New York City, at the um, at the Kennedy Airport, sitting beside me was Ted Shaw, uh, who was who happened to be on the same flight. He was sitting beside me, and he began to narrate the landing. He began to tell me, "Now you look over the water. You see those twin towers way over on the other side." You see him way over there? Well, that's the World Trade Center. And I am i wasn't a big New York City person at that time. I love New York now, but I didn't know then. I didn't, I had never heard of the World Trade Center. And he, he said that he told me and a South African who was entering the country for the first time, what he said was, um, that is the symbol of America's power in the world. And I remember thinking that, wow, I'm going to come back and visit that place someday. Well, I rested over the weekend because I had been in South Africa, my first trip abroad for about five days. And that Tuesday morning, September 11th, I was still in rest mode. I had gone running, walking, and I had come back and laid on the couch in my apartment in Washington when my phone rang. And one of my dearest political friends, Chuck Richardson, was on the phone when I answered it. And he said, do you think it's because of what happened in South Africa? And I was like, what are you talking about? And what, 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 do, you, what do you mean? He said, do you think it's because of what happened in South Africa? I said, what are you talking about? He said, Hazel, he said, a plane has hit the World Trade Center, another one has hit another tower up in New York, and one has hit the Pentagon right there where you are. And I sprung to my feet immediately in reporter's mode, and I was about to walk out the door, and my phone rang. This gets very personal. You know, this is the first time I've told these stories, you know, because we're so busy writing them. And it was my son. It was my son in his early 20s at the time. And he said, Mama, I'm coming to get you. Because the, the world thought that Washington, D.C. was on fire and under attack in New York City, et cetera. And he was in Richmond, Virginia, and he just said, I'm coming to get you. You know, one of the stories I wrote later on was that that was when I knew my son had become a man because he was willing to come through fire and danger to get his mama. Okay, so, but I told him, son, as a reporter, I've got to run towards danger. I tried to go out the door again. My sister called. He had called my sister just that quick, said she won't let me take her, so pray for her. So my sister called and she prayed for me and out the door I went. I didn't know where I was going. I just knew I had to go towards wherever the danger was. And so I took a taxi cab and told the taxi cab to take me to the US Capitol. I got out at the Capitol. I started to um, mill around the Capitol grounds and they had evacuated the Capitol, of course. And the first person that I stopped to interview was then Senator Joe Biden. While I was interviewing him, a photographer with all of his stuff on came over to me and he said, they have just shot down another plane over Pennsylvania. Now, I guess that has now become conspiracy theory, um, theory, but in the moment, in the moment, he told me that they have just shot down a plane over Pennsylvania. And I asked you, I asked him, how do you know this? He said, because I have sources. My sources are good. When I left the Capitol ground, I ended up, I took another cab and got as close to the Pentagon as I could. 
and um, coming to a close for this first part here, I got out as close as I could and police had blocked off everything and but I had my press pass, my press credential allowed me to go and join the other reporters who were milling around watching that black smoke billowing and the fire billowing from the Pentagon where that plane had hit. I'll stop right there for now. Thank you, Hazel. Amid the attack on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center, there was action going on with the president. As a White House correspondent for Associated Press, Sonia Ross was the print pool reporter aboard Air Force One with President Bush as he was evacuated during the terrorist attacks. Sonia's 33 career at the Associated Press took her on assignment to 48 countries in all 50 states. She became the AP's first black woman White House reporter in 1995 and in 1999, the first black woman elected to the board of the White House Correspondents Association. In Atlanta native, Sonia became her career, began her career in 1995, setting for her BA in journalism by day at Georgia State University and working as a library, library clerk for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution newspaper at night. The AP hired her as an intern in 1986 and quickly moved her into political reporting. And the rest is Sonia's history. Beyond that we're waiting to hear. Beyond reporting roles, Sonia was an editor for AP on foreign affairs and national security and domestic regional coverage. In 2010, she established specialty race and ethnicity coverage for AP that over the next nine years transformed the media's approach to gathering news for and about people of color. After AP, Sonia became founder and editor in chief of blackwomenunmuted.com. Among her many awards and accolades, Sonia was recently inducted into the Society of Professional Journalists Hall of Fame. Sonia, please tell us your experiences that day. I think you're muted. All right, sorry. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I, I also have goofy Wi-Fi happening up in here, so I might freeze up. I pray that I won't, but um, thanks for having me here. Uh, I was just routinely called body watch or, or uh, just protective pool with the president on his trip to Florida. He wasn't expected really to make any news and we weren't expecting to have to report any news uh, beyond the norm. So it was quite a shock to everybody when everything began to unfold. It, we were in a bubble, so we didn't have access to the images coming out of New York and then eventually out of Washington. So all we had to go on was word of to pick up from the staff traveling with the president. Um, the first word I got was from my colleague traveling along with President Bush, uh, Scott Lindlaw. And because we were working before the internet ever came along, the system that we had for getting the news out is one person is with the president during all the movement the other person is sitting in what was called the filing center where you monitor news networks and actually dictate it to each other or wrote stories and, and transmitted them back by laptop over phone lines. You see, it sounds sort of primitive now with, with what we have going on, but that was the way we operated. So my colleague saw the crawler on CNN as the motorcade the president was in was headed toward Emma Booker Elementary School. And he told me, hey, they just reported on the crawler on CNN that a, that a plane hit the World Trade Center and they didn't have any more information. I called our desk in Washington, same thing, very little information. And my initial thought was, what idiot and then just Cessna into the side of the World Trade Center. Like, didn't they see that huge building? And as time went by and we got to the school, the presidential aides who normally will hang back and try to be cool and share a little as if they're deep throat or somebody, uh, disappeared. We didn't have anybody we could ask anything. 
So only when we got to the school and the rest of the traveling press sort of hipped us to what was going on. Like, oh no, that was no Cessna. That was a huge jet that hit the World Trade Center. Did I have any clue of what? It took us immediately, us being the travel pool, took us immediately into the classroom with the second graders who were going to demonstrate a reading drill for the president. And we waited for the president to come in. And that part of the day looked like your normal staged presidential event. He's sitting there, he's going along with the little drill with the students holding the book they were using. And then Andy Card, his chief of staff, came through a side door in the classroom and whispered into the president's ear. Oh, have we lost you, Sonia? No, I'm here. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yes. You heard whispered into the president's ear. Whispered into the president's ear that um, a second plane had hit the World Trade Center. So those of us in the pool were a little mystified. Uh, we couldn't hear what he said to the president, but I turned to Jay Carney, who was then the Time Magazine correspondent, and said, I think the president's face just confirmed what we want to know. So long story short, they, they had us rush off to uh, the auditorium where the president gave his speech and said that the United States had experienced a terrorist attack. And that was when I said, okay, this is no longer just your body watch presidential protective pool. We are literally getting fired out of the cannon here to do this job. After his speech, they hustled us as quickly as possible into the motorcade to speed off to the tarmac. The president has said he was going back to Washington and all we knew was he was going back to Washington. During this time in the van, and it seemed as if we were rolling on two wheels, we were going so fast that um, the the, the cell phone I had rang and I wasn't even expecting the cell phone to ring because signals were down everywhere. And it was my sister who I jokingly referred to on social media as the good reverend. And she's, she's in Atlanta and she's yelling, hey, where are you? Are you, are you safe? Uh, so I said, um, uh, of course, I'm safe. I'm with the president and we're getting ready to leave Florida. And she said, oh, well, we have to pray for traveling mercy right now. So she made me pray with her. I'm in the van, the van speeding. I'm hanging on to the side of the window because we were going so fast. I didn't want to get thrown around in the van while she's praying for the God to put the angels on the wings of the planes and to protect us all and to let everyone in our circle make it back home safely to their loved ones and all of this. And then I, I, she said, okay, let me know where you are as soon as you get to your next place. And I said, okay, so don't tell mommy I'm traveling. Um, I don't want her to know. I don't want her to worry. And after that, we took off from Sarasota at, with so much speed that it felt as if we, were, we went on a missile launch straight up into the air. And I will um, pause the story there, Yannick. Thank you, Sonia. At 10, 10 a.m., the fourth plane, United Flight 93, en route to San Francisco, crash lands in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, after passengers rally to subdue the hijackers. Surrounded by multiple monitors of raw footage in the control room at CNN's headquarters, producer Jennifer Thomas distilled the harrowing images from around the country to bring the story into the world's living rooms. She is an award-winning broadcast journalist with more than 20 years of experience most recently as an executive producer with CNN, where she served as a 9 a.m. show producer during the September 11th terror attacks. Professor Thomas is now an associate professor and journalism sequence coordinator in the Department of Media, Journalism and Film at her alma mater, Howard University. She earned her Master of Arts degree in journalism from Columbia University, named the Scripps Howards Foundation 2019 Teacher of the Year. She uses multiple instructional methods 
and is dedicated to ensuring her students have a successful transition from the classroom to the newsroom. A 2020 Fulbright Specialist Awardee, she speaks internationally on media freedom issues. She's also the founder of Media Ready Consulting, LLC, which specializes in media training, coaching, and crisis management. Welcome, Professor Thomas. Please let us know what it was like in the control room that day. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I want to say good evening to everyone and to my fellow journalism colleagues who are here and those who are viewing and not on the panel. Uh, this is bringing back so many memories. And I'm also trying to serve as uh, producer of this too. So I'm going to try to get the screen up as I talk as well. But uh, I'll just start off by saying yes. Yeah, so on September 11th, like everyone else has said, it was just a, it was a beautiful day. And as the 9 a.m. show producer at CNN, that meant I was the first one in the building from my show team that meant coming in at three in the morning. So there's a bit of trivia for that day that many people don't know, and which was gonna be our big kicker of the day, the happy story at the end of the show. And that was that Michael Jordan was to announce he was returning to the NBA. Now, the reason that was gonna be such a big story is because our co-anchors were Leon Harris and Darren Kagan in Atlanta. And Leon had jokingly said on air, if Michael Jordan ever returns to the NBA, I'll shave my head. So ta-da, we were going to call him on that bluff <laughs> that day. And during the entire show meeting, uh, we, we talked about uh, what we were gonna do and we, kept it from Leon the entire time. And we said, okay, I got the graphics department to make an image of Leon being bald. So this was gonna be our big fun story. It was a beautiful day. My sister was in town visiting from Michigan. Uh, you know, there was, it was what we call a slow, slow news day. So I was like, whatever happens, nothing better happen to mess up my kicker because we are going to have that at the end of the show. And then just <laughs> as we all know the story and the timeline, uh, just at about 8.45, we heard what I said sounded sort of like a thunder. It was just this loud, thunderous noise. Uh, and, and our set was in the middle of the newsroom. This is in the world headquarters in Atlanta. And we uh, realized in just a few minutes, the sound were footsteps running from our editorial meeting where, where we meet to discuss the coverage of the day with all the bureaus around the world. And those footsteps were uh, running uh, into the newsroom and they, and, and we stood up, it was like, what's going on? And we heard uh, a plane has hit the World Trade Center. So at that point, it, uh, instinctively as a producer, I grabbed my headset, grabbed my notepad and ran into the control room. Uh, and I, you know, this is when, when we say that uh, we go into producer mode and this is the thing that we uh, are trained to do. So I was always known as the producer to call when there was something big breaking, breaking news, because I'm very calm, I can multitask, but this was just very different. And it was, um, as, as some of my colleagues already reported, you know, when, when we first heard it, uh, I was thinking that was like, okay, who, you know, what hit the World Trade Center? We didn't think anything was, we didn't know what it was. There was no thought of terrorism. But the, the difference from, I think, from our perspective and from my perspective is that in the control room, unlike, you know, reporters who were on the ground seeing these horrific images up close and personal, we saw everything. Because in the control room, you have monitors, as Sina said, that were covering the president. We had, and then when we started carrying, like this is when we were carrying WABC's, uh, our affiliates, a live shot while we were getting our crews in order, uh, you saw, we started seeing images from all different locations in New York. Then we started seeing the Pentagon. Then we saw Pennsylvania. Uh, then we saw people jumping. And then I will never forget seeing that second, uh, while we were carrying this live coverage, we had uh, multiple conversations going on, phones that were being picked up, trying to talk to the anchors. And we saw what looked like a little toy plane hit that second tower. And I remember we were, you know, there was so much going on and it was like, wait, what was it? That was a plane, was that a plane? And we got the, the uh, associate producer queue up the video and that's when we saw there was a second plane. And then we knew something, you know, was very amiss. So, you know, it's, we say it's kind of a controlled chaos. 
uh, when breaking news happens. But I think that day was just so crazy because we were getting calls from, of course, the Pentagon, the State Department with the president, our national security people, our people on the ground in New York. Uh, and at that point, you're just trying to determine who you're going to go to at what point uh, and what you're going to do next. So we were in, uh, needless to say, we were there for several hours uh, seeing all these horrific images. And what, as Clem said, I think, you know, it took me 10 years to be able to discuss um, what happened. And I think we all suffered some kind of PD, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome disorder. They brought counselors into CNN. Uh, and it was just a very, very emotionally trying time, but you just really block everything out and just try to tell the story um, and try to do the best. But I think the most difficult time was determining whether to show the video when we started seeing people jumping to their deaths, basically, um, you know, trying to make those decisions. Because unlike today, back then we didn't show people getting shot. We didn't show people, you know, we couldn't show someone being resuscitated. So it was just, um, it was very harrowing from our perspective, but uh, we were really just focused on trying to tell the best, the best job that we could. And I, I'll stop there, um, but yeah. Thank you, Professor Thomas. Mm -hmm. With four planes used as weapons, 9-11 added a tragic twist to Keith Alexander's new beat and a different vantage point for this enduring story. Keith was lead business writer covering the terrorist attacks and the fallout that occurred within the airline industry as a result. For his coverage of the tax, Keith was named a finalist for the 20, 2002 Livingston Awards, a national competition for print and broadcast journalists 35 and younger. Keith spent more than five years as a financial writer for The Post, covering the airline and business travel industries. His former travel column, Business Class, ran weekly from 2001 through 2006. He then switched to crime and social issues, earning a Pulitzer Prize for his work. As crime and courts reporter, he covers some of the district's most heinous murder, tri murder trials and legal issues. He's a graduate of Howard University and this year began serving as editorial advisor for Howard student newspaper, The Hilltop, where he also worked as a journalism major. Thanks for joining us, Keith. And please let us know about your experiences covering 9-11 from a different viewpoint. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I'm just listening to all my colleagues talk about this and I really have not heard such uh, stories in like 20 years. I just, I just really just haven't. Um, I, I don't know why. And just list everyone going through this has just been very moving. Um, so yes, I, I am, ironically enough, I uh, was hired away from USA Today. I, I covered the airline industry for about 10 years. Um, my first job out of, out of Howard with Dayton Daily News in Dayton, Ohio. I covered uh, US Air because uh, they had a hub there. And as a result of that, Business Week Magazine hired me. I covered the US Airways and United Airlines at Business Week Magazine. Then I went to uh, USA Today, covered the airlines again, and then the Post hired me away from USA Today to what? Cover airlines. Um, so I covered the airline industry um, and they hired me to have my own column. Um, so I started the column in February of 2001. Um, and I walk in and start, you know, every week cranking out this column. Um, and then, you know, what, six, seven months, no, seven months later or whatever, um, this happens. Um, and yeah, it was it was a, a crazy a crazy day. Um, that, that morning, you know, first of all, in the Washington Post during that time, most journalists did not get into the newsroom until about 9 30, 10 o'clock, uh, even 10 30, because most journalists work until seven, eight o'clock at night. Um, I get a call first, you know, in the morning as I'm getting ready to go, go to work. Um, a friend of mine she called me said uh, he called me and said, um, you know, a plane hit the World Trade, and just like everyone else, I thought it was a Cessna. It was a private jet, little small little plane. I'm like, how, like something somebody said, how do you not see the World Trade Center? What kind of pilot is this who, who couldn't see those buildings? Um, and so I'm getting dressed and I have CNN on. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. Has CNN on um, as I'm getting dressed. And then yes, I watched the second plane come in. And I, you could see it was a plane, it was a, it was a jetliner. And then that's, that's when I said, oh, something. Um, and then rushed out, rushed out the door, and, and um, I lived on Capitol Hill at the time. It took me about 10 minutes to get downtown on uh, 15th Street. And I usually uh, would, would drive my car to Pennsylvania Avenue, the Eastern Market Station, and catch the Metro. But for whatever reason, I decided to drive to Pennsylvania Avenue, and I caught a cab. As I get into the cab, and we're 
going down into the, into the newsroom, that's when the third plane hit the Pentagon. And everyone in downtown DC was trying to get out of DC. And this cab was like, it was like a salmon fighting upstream because the cab, we were trying to get into downtown DC where all these cars and people, literally people were in the streets running to get out of downtown DC because they believed that DC was under attack. And this cab driver, the entrepreneur that I'm sure that he was, was trying to pick up these passengers. I said, look, these passengers will be here. I got to get uh, to the Washington Post building. You can pick them back up on your way back after you drop me off. Get into the newsroom and it is quiet. It's an eerie silence. Um, the morning editor on the financial desk was there, um, Tom Diamond. Um, and Diamond comes over to me and he says, um, we need to write a story about the FAA shutting down the airline, the aviation industry for the first time in history. Uh, oh yeah, and by the way, we're putting out an afternoon edition of the Washington Post. And so you have an hour to write this story. Yeah, let that sink in. Okay, so I've got to pull all this together because um, the Washington Post decided they would put an afternoon edition out. The first time they have done an afternoon edition uh, since uh, the, um, uh, the, the Gulf War. So I had to figure out, okay, where are my best sources? My best sources are on Wall Street. Well, yeah, calling Wall Street is not going to happen. Other best sources are here in D.C. Yeah, calling D.C. is not going to happen. So I realized I got some good sources in the Midwest and out on the West Coast. All my sources, analysts, former FAA people, um, was able to pull together a story, and that's the story you see on, on, on the screen right there that I went up online at 320, uh, 29, and I had to have, to have that story filed uh, by noon so it could make the afternoon edition. That was it, it, just calling around, talking to airlines, talking to former airline executives, trying to figure out what did this mean? Trying to figure out, okay, what is going to be the ripple effect, right? We, we saw uh, airlines going under, filing for bankruptcy. Uh, union uh, contracts being nullified because of this. Um, and just the whole panic that, uh, that overtook the airline industry. And because I covered the industry, I was one of the lead writers at the Washington Post covering these attacks, you know, covering them from the vantage point of from the airline side. So that was probably just, you know, it, it was a very crazy time. And, you know, I am one of the few reporters who actually had a byline um, in that afternoon, September 11th edition. Um, and I think it was Pam, somebody who said how surreal it was. You know, I was running around being in the newsroom, listening to my colleagues uh, on the national desk when the, when the, when the um, towers collapsed, burst out screaming, in tears, crying, screaming, literally. Hard Washington Post journalists screamed out crying. Um, and, I'm, and, and, and I'm also worried about my friends in New York, worried about my family and friends at home in Pittsburgh, because I'm not too far from Pittsburgh where, where the fourth plane uh, went down. And then also, um, at one point, um, a colleague and I, we went downstairs to get some coffee, and she started crying in the, in the, in the stairwell. Um, and I had to comfort her, and we just kind of talked talk through this and get our, get our minds back together. The emotions that was going on um, within the newsroom as we're trying to tell this story and trying to get our hands around this story um, and just realizing we've got to get this story out. Um, and then I think it really hit me, not until like nine o'clock at night when I, I finally left the newsroom and walked out onto 15th Street and it was dead silence, quiet, until I saw a couple of tanks, army tanks coming down 15th Street, how surreal that was. And I caught the Metro home and I was the only one on my Metro car that I can see all the way down through. And I'm the only one in that car. And that's when I realized, wow, what just happened on this day? Um, so anyway, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Independent journalist, Melanie Eversley, reporter from New York as a Washington correspondent for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, Cox Newspapers. She went to New York, not only to tell this major story, but also to check on her mother. She continued to cover the ramifications of 9-11 for years after that fateful day. Melanie is a veteran journalist who has covered race for the Detroit Free Press and worked as a Washington correspondent for two news organizations, the Free Press of Knight Ritter Newspapers and Atlanta Journal-Constitution, part of Cox Newspapers. She was on the staff at USA Today for 13 years, covering breaking news, race, and more. She is a freelance journalist based in New York and she has contributed to Fortune, National Geographic, NBC News, BET.com, and other news organizations. 
She's also founder of the Beyond the Railroad News platform. Melanie is a graduate of Oberlin College and the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. Oh, Melanie, thanks for joining us today. And let us hear about your experience covering 9-11. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. I really uh, appreciate this conversation. Uh, it's an honor um, to share the same panel with folks whose work I respect. Um, it's, I found it's also been cathartic to have these conversations. Um, just like everybody else, I push 9-11 to the back of my mind. Um, I'm, a, I'm originally from New York. I'm back here now. It took me almost 20 years to actually go visit Ground Zero. I would not if I had to even walk by that street, I would look somewhere else. If friends came from out of town to visit, said they wanted to go see it, I'd say, I'll meet you afterwards. I just wanted to know parts of it. And I finally visited um, right before the pandemic. And it was very, uh, it was a, a release kind of. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, as you said, I was working in Washington um, for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Uh, and it's kind of odd because I was supposed to be off on the 11th. I was going to take a day trip to Philly. Um, but the night of the 10th, I became ill at home. I was up until like the wee hours. And then I finally, you know, fell asleep. And uh, the next morning, my phone woke me up. I had no idea what had been happening in the world. And uh, my editor was in Atlanta. I pick up the phone and there's all this static. And I'm like, what's going on? So I said, hi, David, what's up? And I know he was surprised that I asked him what was up. Uh, and he said, well, turn on your TV. And, you know, I channel flipped and, you know, you know what the headline said, you know, America under attack, war in America. And it took me a second to kind of wake up and realize it wasn't a movie and this was really happening. So, you know, I jumped into emergency mode and, uh, you know, threw on some clothes and I was, uh, I forget how I was gonna get into the office. I usually didn't drive. Um, ironically, I lived in Logan Circle, a few blocks from the Washington Post. So I know that airy silence that Keith was speaking of because I went outside and there was, there was no one there. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna drive to work. And I drove through silent streets. I parked right in front of our building. We had a bureau, um, I forget the name of this building, but a number of news organizations have offices there. And uh, it's like about a block and a half from the, the Senate. It's between the Senate and Union Station. I got a space right in front, you know, and walk into the office and everybody is just silent. And all you hear are you know, the sounds of keys clicking. So I'm, I'm telephoning all my lawmakers. Everybody had, you know, an emotional story to tell. Um, uh, Jack Kingston, Congressman from, from uh, Savannah, I remember he said that he told uh, two of his, his interns just get in their car and drive to Georgia. Uh, other folks had stories. Somebody else told me a rumor that there was a plane headed for the Capitol, uh, you know, that had been, um, you know, intervened. Uh, and all during that time, I couldn't reach relatives in New York, uh, couldn't reach friends. So I was in physically in DC, but my mind was in New York. So uh, at one point, um, the Bureau, it was the Cox Newspapers Bureau, we had a meeting to figure out coverage and uh, the Bureau Chief asked for volunteers to go to New York. So I immediately raised my hand. Um, a photographer and I uh, said we would go, uh, Brick McKay, who passed away a few years ago, sadly. Um, but we, as soon as we filed, we got on a train that night and um, it, was, it was really odd because uh, no matter where I've lived, Detroit, Maryland, Washington, upstate New York, New Jersey, I've always um, been proud uh, to be a New Yorker. I've always visited really often. And I was used to that drive from DC to New York. Uh, and at a certain point, like as you're approaching the Lincoln Tunnel, you would always see the, you know, the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers. And this ride was really just surreal because when we hit South Jersey, um, I saw this cloud in the sky and it took a while for me to realize that even that far south, it was the smoke from the World Trade Center. And it was so strange to even approach the Lincoln Tunnel and not see the towers there. So, uh, you know, we, we uh, arrived in New York, um, like everybody else said, it was a beautiful sunny day. And uh, we uh, exited Penn Station and walked out to an empty street and Rick and I said, okay, we're gonna separate. Uh, and um, 
you know, I said, I'm going to walk to ground zero, which was like a three mile walk. And I don't know where, you know, Rick went. Um, and the first thing, the first people I spoke with were um, a couple of Congress members who had just taken a tour of ground zero. I got as close as I could. Um, keep in mind, everything was sort of like in chaos. Everything was sort of surreal. So nobody was paying attention to what sort of reporters credentials you had. Um, and I got as close as I could up until like a police barrier. And uh, uh, Congressman Carolyn Maloney and uh, former Congressman Charles Rangel were just coming from ground zero, from behind the barrier. They had just taken a tour. And I remember Carolyn Maloney said to me, you don't wanna see what's back there. So um, I spent uh, two weeks just, it felt like I was just kind of wandering. Um, I figured, you know, the AJC sent me there and Cox sent me there not to cover a press conference where everybody was going to be, but to talk to people and to kind of get around the city because I knew it. So that's what I did. I just, you know, I just wandered. I remember, um, I mean, if this was a movie, there are, there are certain people in certain snippets that I'll always remember. Um, I remember walking by a bar that first day, the door was open and there were these firefighters in there covered in soot. There was a soot that covered everything, your face, your tongue, you breathed it in, it was everywhere. And uh, they were covered in it. And I remember asking them if they wanted to talk and they said, nope. Uh, I, um, I met complete strangers who offered me, um, offered to have me over for dinner because they knew people would want to talk. Um, after a couple of days, the NYPD said, uh, you know, we can't have all these reporters just kind of running around. So you've got to come to police headquarters and get credentials. So while I was standing on this line for about 12 hours, you know, we went from day into night, um, I started talking to the reporter from the Christian Broadcasting Network. And at one point she said, um, would you like to pray? And I said, yes. So we sat on the curb and this woman prayed her heart out. I mean, she prayed her heart out. And I, and I threw a little tidbits in at the end and I felt so much better after that. I mean, I, I didn't realize I had been carrying all this stuff in. And I remember that night uh, I went for a coffee run while we were online and uh, there was a police officer at a barricade and we just started talking about how crazy and surreal everything was. And he told me the story about how he went home to take a nap for a couple of hours. And his son, who was maybe three, fell asleep at his feet. And he said when he woke up, he had to kind of peel his son off of him. And then he just like broke down um, in front of me. So, you know, I, I hugged him. Um, but there were just a lot of, uh, lot of experiences like that. Um, at one point I headed over to the morgue, uh, you know, not to be, um, you know, too upsetting for folks, but they had an operation outside of the morgue so that people could sort the, you know, remains. And uh, I went there and I noticed that there were people who were um, pasting flyers all over the wall, all over the lamppost, mailboxes. Every flyer said missing. If you've seen so-and-so, please call this number. You know, all these folks, had convinced themselves that they said if anybody survived that collapse, our Joe survived, and he's probably just walking around not knowing what's going on, and um, you know we just want to be reconnected with him. There's like hundreds, hundreds of posters like this. I connected with this one family um, that were they, they were putting up a poster for their it was uh, this woman's son. And uh, this guy's brothers and sisters were there. He worked at Car Futures. He was I think 29, uh, his name was Timor Khan. And I remember his mom said to me, I still feel my son, I feel him. I know he's still alive. And so I spent a few days with them. Uh, and in the two weeks, each time I spoke with them, their mood was less and less optimistic. Um, and then uh, there are some folks that I uh, you know, followed up with later. But anyway, I spent about two weeks just kind of like on my feet all the time. The thing was, for me, I didn't want to slow down because if I slowed down to think about it, it made me sad. Um, so I just kept going, filing. And then after two weeks, um, this editor who I had been uh, assigned, all of us who were covering the attacks were assigned an editor named Bert Routen, 
who had covered wars and he knew how to organize chaos. And I remember it was a Sunday and I think I called him to tell him what I was gonna cover for that day. And he said, no, nope, I think it's time for you to rotate out, you and the others, and I'm gonna bring some folks in. And I argued with him and he said, no, believe me, I'm right, trust me. I said, okay. I went home, went, well, went to my mom's house, turned on the TV. And I remember there was this church service. Uh, it was a memorial service. And uh, somebody had taken a close up of the actor, Benjamin Bratt, who was in the audience. And there were just tears streaming down his face. And I don't know why, but that's the moment that it kind of hit me, like what I was covering. Uh, and I'll just end it there. Thank you, Melanie. Um, if you'd like to start raising your electronic hand, we'll um, recognize your questions. But before we go to that, I wanted to ask all of you, um, you know, as, as journalists, sometimes we joke about that when everybody is running away from something that we're running towards it. And I remember on around that time, around 9-11, which happens to be Professor Sturgis's birthday, we were talking about that. And she's talking about her sister running away from it. And then we would have been going towards it you know, to tell the story and help to help people understand what's going on and also to see what's going on. But um, this was kind of a mega thing to, to run towards. So I wanted to ask all of you, how did you, you know, some of you have mentioned a little bit, how did you cope with what you were experiencing and seeing and how did you, how do you manage pushing through a deadline on a story like this? And who wants to, anyone in particular want to start with that? I, I could start and just say, just especially when we talk about deadlines and pushing through because everyone had so many, brought so many memories from um, the story shifting from the, the day everything happened uh, and then coming back in for me again at the crack of dawn, 3 a.m. again the next morning. And it was just like one of those stories that just doesn't end. And, and then people wanted to come on on, a, on air to talk about their missing and it, then it shifted to the missing, then it shifted to the terrace. And so there were so many things and you know, with all the updates that were happening, we were always trying to get a story out and, uh, and tell a story, it still have some humanity to it, but still have to tell you know, the ugly story uh, and try to get it done in a timely manner. That was a very, very difficult and I, we didn't really have a guideline on how to do it. One thing I think that uh, that I remember very vividly is how it strangely brought, you know, everyone came together on that story uh, from whoever was out covering the story, wherever, you know, even when we started the terrorist ones and we had people overseas, everyone kind of came together uh, collectively, um, but it was very draining. And it was, you sort of kind of go, you put yourself on this autopilot so you're not really thinking of yourself you're thinking that you know i have to get the story told so for me you know i picked up the phone my sister was in town as i mentioned and i called her for literally like one minute said are you okay is everyone okay she's like oh my god because she was watching to see this fun story at the show in the show and that was it and you know i couldn't think about anything else uh, so it was just a very, it was very trying time, but, you know, just knowing you had to get the story done and then searching for, I was always trying to search for some of those um, human stories that there were so many out there, but it was just almost impossible when you're rolling breaking news uh, for days and literally days and weeks on end. And then the anthrax stuff happened, you know, then there are so many other stories that happened after that. Yeah, I, I really think that, um, and Desiree Williams is asking me about the legacy of the black journalist and unsung heroes and how do you, and she said, uh, how do you all suggest we carry such a rich legacy of black journalists? I, I think that I was kind of um, prepared, if you can, imagine you you would think that nobody would be prepared for september 11th but as i said earlier i was in durban south africa only four days earlier in the midst of a protest and uh forgive me i need to uh, correct a mistake of fact i said it was george hw bush it was actually george w bush it, that they were protesting saying the blood of our children is on his hands or on America's hands and I'm in the midst of this protest and I get interviewed and my brother in Orange, Virginia, away from Durban, he hears me on the radio, you know, talking about American arrogance and um, 
I've been called the N-word to my face in my career. Um, just some of the things that Black reporters, for the Black press specifically, go through. I just really felt that I was um, kind of prepared for September 11th. What I wasn't prepared for on September 11th was the emotional capital as it pertained to um, you know, my family and my son, et cetera, like I, like I said, and also the stories that I had to do afterward. Um, that nothing could have prepared me for going to um, interview the mother of Rodney Dickens, the 11 year old, one of the children who was on the plane flight 77 that crashed into the Pentagon um, on his way to California to a National Geographic conference for sixth graders. Nobody prepared me for that, you know, level of heartbreak and going to that mother's apartment um, and having to face her other two children that looked up to their older brother, you know, Rodney. So it's the emotional capital. And like somebody is saying, I'm just reading the chat and somebody said that nobody prepares, uh, nobody thinks about the mental health of journalists. And um, I guess that's right, you know, the PTSD. Um, that was spoken to earlier and, and, and what it is that I'm experiencing, you know, the feeling right now, um, feelings right now that I've never felt before because I've never talked about this before. But yet, on well, that day I felt prepared. One of the things I also want to talk about, just add real quick, was that when they talk about the Black journalists, I think we all have been in this position. I mean, I've been in a newsroom since I was 16 years old. And it's when big news stories happen, the, the editors often don't pick journalists to cover them who look like me or they in, in newsrooms. You know? and, and I was I was very accustomed to that, not being picked to, to cover the big story. So when I walked into the newsroom and the, they editor says, we need you to write this story and to anchor this story, it, it was like, oh, wow, okay, because we're not used to that. And we're not used to being the anchor. We're not used to being the lead writer on big day stories, the big stories like this. And that was the one thing that I was just like, wow. And so day after day after day, so at least for a week, I was anchoring stories. And I remember Vanessa Williams, who's a colleague of mine, um, she was president of the National Association of Black Journalists, NABJ, at, at the time. And she was in the newsroom over in Metro, and she sent me an email that said, thank you, the subject line. And I didn't know what she was talking about. I said, what do you mean, thank you? She's, and then she responded, she said, you really are the only black journalist here at the Post who is anchoring and leading the coverage. And so thank you for that. And I was like, I didn't recognize it really. I was in, in that mode of cranking and cranking and cranking that you were just trying to prove that, yes, I can be that journalist that you come to in a clutch, a big breaking story. You can come to someone who looks like me. I think that really what I was just trying to keep going and, and keeping at that pace um, because you know, it was not B as, as well. So that's, that was, was going through my head. Can I add, and I know I don't, I'm just gonna say very quickly, just to piggyback on that, because that's so important. And I've had friends, journalist friends who, you know, talked about the coverage and I, I was the only black producer at the time, if I recall, there may have been one other black, I was the only black female. And then when I was promoted, I was the only black executive producer for any of the news networks. So you don't think of the enormity of that to your point, mm -hmm. Keith, but you know you bear a great responsibility. I don't have a choice. I don't have an opportunity to mess up, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. for, for to be to to be the producer, you know, when they're going around doing specials, no one's coming to me to ask me. To your point, you know, they know who I, you know, I was there, but no one's necessarily coming to me. But you're doing your job and you're doing it well, and then you you recognize the significance of it later. But it's important, and that's why I'm so glad we're having this panel to talk about to talk about that. You know, I seriously doubt that anyone who has ever been an architect of what reporters are supposed to do when reporters are supposed to do it would have ever conceived uh, that a presidential evacuation nuclear bunker pool being used for the first time in American history would have had journalists in it being black. They never would have thought that. First of all, 
um, I doubt seriously that anyone would have considered just this little black girl from the South uh, to be in there doing this job on that level in that particular moment in time. And so for me, it became a challenge. I said, and no offense to anybody, but the hell if anybody's gonna knock me out of this story uh, while I'm doing it. And I am not about to become a cautionary tale of why you don't let black people do things. And I certainly am not going to uh, operate in any way that would give anyone in this industry the belief that another black girl couldn't come behind me and do this same thing. So most of that day was a challenge for me. I said, I am going to outperform. I'm going to perform beyond the level that's expected. As it was, that particular trip for the president had been declared a news-free zone and treated like a scrub trip, what they call the scrub trip, you know. There was supposed to be a big economic address by the president the following week. So the, all of the sales for that moment, and they treated this trip like it's a nothing trip to Florida. So put a secondary person on that because you're needed for this bigger thing later. I had just come off because it was not. You're being frozen a little. Sonia, I think, oh, there you are. I want to blame the NSA for that. But, <laughs> I, but let me just say I was not about to even let anybody have the ability to say that that Black girl didn't do that job that day and that I didn't make the first use of this pool the best of its magnitude. You know, I reported absolutely everything. I nailed down everything, even if it was just the timeline. What time was it when such and such happened? What time was it when such and such happened? You know, I made sure I knew the answer to that question. I made sure that I could sneak and put my, um, turn my cell phone back on whenever I could turn my cell phone back on and pick up um, information. I made sure I had a question every time anybody came back on into the press cabin on Air Force One to say anything. The first update that we got was that um, President Bush had, uh, President Bush had gotten uh, a chance to call Vladimir Putin, then the president of Russia, uh, to say, hey, we've been attacked by terrorists. So I said, well, why him? Why'd you call him? And the short answer was, well, I don't have an answer to that question, Sonia. And the next question that I had for them was, OK, this executive order that the president just signed, uh, allowing a breach in the military chain of command, why is it retroactive? You know, questions that, honestly, the people around me did not have answers for, but it wasn't going to be for lack of a question. You know, I had to make sure that they understood that um, they'd have to find an answer for me before I would sit there with absolutely nothing to say. Um, I, it bothers me. I bring that up because it does bother me a bit to uh, when I watch journalists of today and so many just don't seem to have a question. And that should not be. But um, I had to set my emotions aside. I had to set any concerns that I had aside. Um, all the talk about surface to air missiles hitting the plane and it might take us down and then it'd just be President Bush and 15 others perished or I'd be in the 15 others, but I was gonna go down in the 15 others asking my questions and doing my job. Thank you. Um, I was gonna get back to this one part. Oh. oh. This one, okay, I just wanted to make sure we get back to this one part also. Um, sorry, we're cutting you off, Melanie. We can get back to what you're gonna say. But um, I know Jennifer mentioned her newsroom having some counselors come in. Did, and some of you have mentioned prayer, but did, did anyone seek any therapy after this or since then um, for this? I did not and, take advantage of it and I wish I had, and I still think I will. And I've been asked that a lot, but one of my associate producers quit because it was just took too much of an emotional toll. Um, and she left the business and came back. Uh, but yes, uh, I, that's something I regret. And I didn't think at the time I had a problem because that's what we do. I've covered many other stories, Oklahoma City bombing, you know, we've seen things, but this was just so different and it never ended. And I uh, wish we would have, but they did bring them in. A few months ago, I was, had the honor of moderating a panel for, the, for WABJ on that very topic, on mental health, for journalists. 
Um, and I was surprised that they had a, a, a therapist who talked about that reporters can experience PTSD just by receiving information, by interviewing people. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought you actually had to be there and, and experience all, all of that, but you could actually, by absorbing that energy and talking to people, you could actually go through all that. And I was very surprised by that. And, and, um, and so we talked about that during, during the panel discussion. So to answer your question, no, I have not. And this is someone who covers crime and, and courts and all that stuff and covered uh, uh, Hurricane Katrina. Um, maybe it's not too late. I don't know. We'll see. It's never too late. And uh, Professor Sturgis has put a link to the Dart Center, um, which also deals with trauma and journalists um, in, the, in the chat. Um, so I'll go to you, Melanie, and then we're going to go to another audience member and then to Emmanuel Lipscomb, who's waiting patiently to ask his question. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yeah, my comment was actually about the mental health aspect. Um, I think a lot of us, uh, well, first off, I just want to say, I think it's fortunate that this anniversary is happening when mental health is on the national table now. You know, Simone Biles and um, Naomi Osaka have made it that way. And uh, I think it may be giving a lot of people um, room to um, seek some mental help for things that um, they they should have. Uh, I know when uh, you know I was here in New York, and then I went back to my bureau in Washington, um, and would just kind of come back to New York occasionally to cover follow ups um, to the terror attacks. It was very lonely because when I came back to Washington, um, certainly folks were you know cognizant of everything that had happened, but they hadn't been breathing soot and crying with folks and. Uh, you know, I, I, my bureau chief at the time, um, I'm not sure he, you know, quite understood, you know, what that was like. For me, um, it's helped to find advocates where I can, um, an editor here, an editor there. I was fortunate during the, uh, the time that I was covering um, New York, I had two very sensitive editors uh, uh, who were really supportive um, when I spoke with them every day. One of them was Angela Tuck who's an NABJ member. Um, so I, you know, I think people just kind of look for support where they can find it. Thank you. Um, I wanna to go to Allison Davis for a minute. Um, she had mentioned that she was walking towards the World Trade Center um, to get a cup of coffee and the second plane flew over her. And uh, she's a veteran journalist. And if I remember correctly, a founder of the National Association of Black Journalists. Yes, and uh, thank you. I've been asked um, <laughs> throughout the last couple of days to write down and remember some of the things that happened. Let me just say that um, I, uh, by the time uh, 2001 uh, happened, I was actually a suit at, um, at uh, uh, CBS. And so um, I really missed uh, the reporting. And I volunteered for my diocesan, I'm, I'm an Episcopalian, my diocesan newspaper. And I'm, I actually will show the, the copy here. Um, and let's see if I can. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it's, it's called The Voice. And they sent me to Trinity Wall Street um, to do a story about the Bishop of, of Wales. And I was happy to go, um, but I know how terrible church coffee is. And so I decided to get a couple of dollars from the, uh, the bank. And I noticed, and I think somebody else mentioned all of the paper and, the, and, and, the, and everything, I think Clem mentioned it, everything that was raining down on us. And of course, I don't pay much attention to anything in the morning. And so I'm thinking, you know, was there a ticker tape parade? Um, but there was not because a large, a very large um, black um, binder fell down right in front of me. And so I'm at the corner with a couple of other people and the first plane had already come in and uh, the fire department and the fire engines were coming down the street. And I asked the woman who was directing traffic, I said, what happened? He said, small, she said, small plane um, uh, just hit one of the buildings. So she said, just wait here and then you can go. So she didn't stop us and we're still walking. I'm still thinking about that um, Starbucks kiosk in building two of the World Trade Center. And as I'm approaching, um, 
I saw the second plane and I thought I was watching a movie. Um, the sky was so incredible and, and, and this plane seemed to be going in slow motion and we all just hit the ground. I had a very cheap digital camera, very cheap. And at Macy's, if you paid $100 for your kids um, back to school clothing, which I did, they gave you a free camera. And so I had that camera and I was more concerned about the framing of the picture. And I literally on the ground took a picture of the plane going into the second building. And then I made a decision. And the decision was I had two small boys at home and I could either run towards the story or I could run away from it. And I ran away from it. I ran away because I wanted to see my kids. And um, I had a problem with that for years as a journalist I, and, and still do. And I will just say to end this, I, I don't watch the commemorations. Uh, yes, um, I didn't sleep for three days. And finally my husband and CBS said, it's time for you to go seek some, uh, to talk to a, a, a therapist, which I did. Um, but in addition, I, my son had to talk to a therapist, my youngest son, who was in elementary school at the time, because he, um, all he knew was his mom was someplace that she shouldn't have been in danger. And so we sent him to a therapist and they had him draw pictures. And I still have the picture that he drew. He drew a plane going into a building very crudely and me on, um, he drew me saying, help me, help me. And, you know, um, uh, my kids are 29 now and, and 35 and, and uh, um, but um, I share all that just, just to say that I was, I'm delighted about the comments that you all have made. This is the first time, this is a real step for me because I ignore this commemoration every year. And I was so tempted to find out the other side, the newsroom and my, my colleagues, many of you I've worked with in, in various situations. And so I, I, I thank you and I thank Howard for, for having this. And I thank you for the for the honesty and for allowing me to see the other side of the story because I was the victim on, 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 on that day. Thank anyway. you, Allison, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. and, um, thank you so much. Um, Emmanuel Lipscomb, you've been waiting patiently. You have a question and we'll get to some of the other questions in the chat as well. Well, mine's not really a question. My name's Emmanuel Lipscomb. I was director of the Martin Luther King Family Life Institute who was meeting with someone across the street from the World Trade on September 11, 2001. I stayed there, we were witness, uh, the, we heard the first plane, we watched the second plane flying to the building and we saw the people panicking. What they don't talk about is there were 30 to 50,000 people at that location normally every day. So a, a whole group of citizens didn't run, they stayed with me and we, basically cleared the streets so the fire workers and the rescue workers could come. And then when the police, they did come, they put us in a tape zone across the street from the building. And with all, it almost immediately, we heard the, a big boom and we looked above our head and the whole building was coming down on top of us. So, you know, I turned, the man next to me turned, we started running towards the building behind us to get shelter. He got hit, I jumped in a hole in the wall and a tsunami-like storm of concrete fire and steel and dead bodies came down on top of our heads and came up the street and just washed everything away. And by the blessings of God, I live. It's a long story, but I'm not gonna go into all that of everything else that happened. But I just wanna say that what we don't talk enough about is that there were fire and the first responders, but before there were first responders, there were a lot of citizens that looked like you and me that did not care about their own lives as much as they cared about saving the lives of others. And I just applaud them. I've represented them in Congress. I've represented them to four administrations. And I just say that we, in all of our communities, we need to be out here and we need to do more to save each other's lives because it's so important. And I salute each and every one of you all, because we really need the media 
that looks like us to help our stories get out here in the public. So I thank you all for having this and for sending me this email so I would know even to be on here today. And God bless you all. Thank you so much for sharing your story and for your comments too. That's one of the reasons we have um, the Reporting While Black series so we can share some of these stories. But we also appreciate that you appreciate the work of Black journalists. Um, we'll take some other questions. And uh, there was a question, I'm, oh, with technology and mobile devices, this is from Douglas Price. The visual media has morphed into something that was inconceivable 20 years ago. How do you think this generation of journalists and editors would cover such a catastrophic event today? Anyone wanna take that one? Okay, I'll bite. Um, I would just say that a large amount of it would um, would have unfolded on Twitter. We would see Instagram videos. We'd get opinions on both uh, or really all four sides of an issue immediately in real time. And the news cycle would be relentless and the stress levels would be even higher than they were 20 years ago. Uh, those families who were putting up the, the images looking for their missing loved ones. That was a rudimentary Facebook. And today those very same images would be unfolding before our eyes relentlessly on Facebook, on Instagram. There'd be TikTok videos. I mean, it just depends on what cycle of it all that this would have unfolded. If it were today, this is what we'd be looking at. If it were 10 years ago, uh, we would have had a whole lot of this stacked up in our email and just beginning to have it on social media for what it was. So in, in, in a lot of ways, it is a blessing that we did not have social media at that time because people I think were more careful with the facts. As it was, there was an erroneous report that a bomb had detonated at the State Department. And it took a few minutes to clear that up that no, there was no car bomb at the State Department. So just imagine the distortions and the misinformation and outright lies that would be passed around as fact were there a social media presence in that day. So. I consider that a bit of a blessing. I agree with that wholeheartedly with uh, so, you know, with all the images, as you said, Sonia, that were coming in that day. Uh, can you imagine how misinformation, you know, there are several of us here who, who work in that space too, would have gone out had there been all those different avenues and outlets. And I think to your point, we were so careful uh, with all of the information that was coming in to uh, really scrutinize that before we let it go out on air. I think that just doesn't happen anymore. You know, not to any extent that it should. That's one of my biggest complaints now with uh, where we are now as, as journalists and how the news is disseminated. Yeah, I, I, particularly on a story this horrific, I think it would have been, like you said, um, a little bit too much to show some of, some of that. Um, that it is, and, and, and as it is, uh, people have mentioned the National Geographic documentary, you have to be prepared to watch that as well because it's, um, some of it they don't show, but they tell you a lot too. So, and you can, you're a visual thinker, you can imagine it. So if those of you are triggered, think about it before you watch it. Um, someone was about to say something. Professor Lamb, I wanted to respond to a question that I saw, that's okay. Um, I think it was Robin Smith who asked the question. I was going to mention that one next. Oh, okay. You want to go ahead with you it? Go ahead. You can okay. go, you can rephrase it since you're Did there. Did any you can... of you experience the relaxation of thoughts of race because we were all under siege? And that may be the perception um, that we were all under siege. But in the Black press, um, we don't have that luxury to relax thoughts of race. Um, when I, at that time, was working for the first time 
um, for a new editor, George Carey. And my responsibility was to focus on race. Everybody who knows George know he, when he makes an assignment, <laughs> you know, he meant what he said, and so I had to leave the Pentagon. He pulled me off the Pentagon to walk the streets close to the Pentagon to interview the people. And one guy that I interview, I will never forget because he told me that, and he was a black guy, he told me that he um, was outside dumping the trash. His responsibility was to dump the trash from the kitchen. Every day he was a custodian. And he heard the plane come. He saw the smoke, so he knew that the plane had crashed into the Pentagon. My brother went back into the kitchen, went back into the building. Instead of leaving, running, he went back in to get permission to leave. And so, of course, you know, I have written added that story in, um, that account in with my story. But the point is that when people abroad, when they think of American power, when Ted Shaw was showing me the Twin Towers and saying that's the symbol of American power around the world, they are not necessarily thinking about us. And so, you know, to think about it from a race perspective, I'm thinking about the oppression of Black people in America and how I had to go interview him. Um, you know, this young man who had to go back in to get permission to leave. So there is so much um, that has to do with race in America that even we can't, we haven't even fully told the story of how September 11th eclipsed the World Conference Against Racism. Just one little story from Durban, South Africa. They had somebody drew in the Sowetan newspaper. The Sowetan newspaper had a an editorial cartoon of Colin Powell chained to the White House saying to President George W. Bush, Massa, can I go? Everything goes back to race and somebody's got to document it. So my mind never, never relaxed. And it just, and when I, Massa, can I go meant can he go from America to represent America in the World Conference Against Racism. They're yeah. not thinking about uh, Black people. Uh, They're thinking about uh, the big power. Yeah, someone uh, someone mentioned sorry. also, oh, go ahead, Clem. Well, two things. Um, one, I just want to put a little levity in the in the, the, the discussion. I mean, it's um, uh, my wife and I, we live in Park Slope, which is, you know, was gentrifying at the time and 9-11. Um, and, uh, and we went around the corner to, um, uh, you know, the, the New York, you know, y'all know New York, New York doesn't stop, right? And when, when you get on the subway in New York and the subway's quiet, you know, something happened, right? So you get on the subway, nobody's talking. People, I mean, the unity in this place was amazing. So we go around the corner, they had a, a, a sort of, um, you know, let's all brotherhood stand in the street and we're going to talk and sing songs and kumbaya kind of thing. And it was the, the funniest part about it, as we could get some levity, as they started singing, um, we shall overcome, right? And we're the only black people in the group. And but nobody knew the second verse. So it was like a it's like that. It was, that's the funny part. So the other part though, and I, I put it in the questions, listen, the story isn't over. A lot, we have to look at where are the black folks on this victim's compensation fund. I have as a gentleman, my a brother-in-law, um, one of my brother-in-law's best friends sat here in my house. He is dead. He literally he was a, one of the cooks there down at the World Trade Center or, um, and he stayed. No, he wasn't a cook, he was a janitor. I'm sorry, he was a janitor there. But he stayed, of course, they were cleaning up across the street from the World Trade Center, the um, third, three World Trade Center with the globe and all that stuff that they now have in the museums. He was cleaning up, he brought them down there. Well, Boyd came down with everything. You name it, he had it. it, it was, he had a very slow, very, very difficult time, and he had great difficulty getting on that victim's compensation fund so his his medical would be taken care of, right? And he died from COVID last year. I mean, it's it's we should look at that. Those of you who are, are working, please, if you get a chance, look at that because people still 
need help. And a lot of cops, a lot of people who deserve it are getting the help they need, but a lot of latecomers are having great difficulty having their things taken care of. So please, if you, you're still out there, take it, see if you can pitch it, see if we can get that done. Thank you. Thank you. Some people are also mentioning in the chat too that when you look at some of the commemorations and um, stories around memorials that they don't really include uh, African-Americans that much in those stories as well. The Chicago <laughs> Crusader newspaper just today um, ran a collage of black people saying these are the victims of 9-11 that you have never seen. And it was all black people who were victims either, either in the World Trade Center or uh, the Pentagon, et cetera. And so, the, like you're saying, the story is still being told. I think it's important to uh, remember, too, when it comes to the coverage, if we're not uh, fortunate enough, like Hazel, to have our own or to work for the Black press, you know, I, I always go back to saying the same thing. We have to, it depends on who's in the room. And if you're, you know, who's in the room making the decisions for who to cover, who to bring on to talk. And that's something I think uh, my perspective and what, you know, as educators now, that I stress to all of my journalism students that whether or not you want to admit it, you do have a responsibility uh, to tell those stories and those perspectives that are not told. And even during that time when we were interviewing, you know, all the people someone had mentioned before who were looking for their loved ones or those who were victims or some of the stories of the heroes and heroines, uh, you know, I'm always looking for someone that looks like me because we're there, like you said, but in, in, right. I do agree that in some, a lot of cases, you don't think nobody said, you wouldn't know, you know, there's a black producer there, you know, you would, but so that just trickles to every other aspect of news coverage. And we have to make sure that our voices are heard and that we speak up. And those of you all who know me know that that's never been uh, something I have a problem with, but uh, we have to be intentional about that. Over Thanks, the, Thank um, you for the idea. Week, oh, sorry. Oh, okay, over the next week is back to Hazel's point. Um, HUNewsService.com is running some stories related to 9-11 that our students are writing. And then also BlackWomenUnmuted.com, which um, Sonia runs there. She has a, a video that will be there. There'll be something in FierceForBlackWomen.com as well. And it was someone asked, well, you, you mentioned the Chicago Crusader, was that right, Hazel? Yes, it was the, the Crusader, Chicago oh. Crusader. Okay, and then um, Keith, you were about to say something. Oh, before you say something, because everyone is so engaged, we're going to go 15 minutes more. So if you can stay with us, please stay with us. Okay, Keith. Just, just real quick, I'm just going to pick up what, what uh, Clem said, because what he said, I, I, I'm really just, I didn't think about this. You know, individuals who, who have pre-existing conditions, right, um, because they were exposed uh, to what happened on 9-11, on um, are probably dying as a result of COVID, right? And it, I didn't even dawn on me. So there is a connection between COVID and 9-11 today. That's stories that should be told even today. So thank you for reminding me of that. That, that is something that I didn't even, didn't even dawn on me, that there is still a connection uh, to what's happening today 20 years ago. Thank you, my brother, for that. Yes. And, and along those lines, too, um, one of our alums, I see Brooke, uh, Brookie was asking about um, dealing with mental health and health and whether we're incorporating it in, into the curriculum. We just started a new health and science um, journalism course that I'm teaching. It's interdisciplinary, so we have a psychology major in it, and he wants to do some mental health reporting, but we've also, I've also asked him to do some stories that are sparked by 9-11 related to health and mental health. And the woman in this picture, is this the woman you were mentioning, Sonia, in the in the chat? I and know Clem said he saw her. Yes. Yes, that is her. Her name was Marcy Borders. She died of cancer in 2015 at age 42. I believe oh, if I'm recalling the stories correctly about her, that particular day, she had just begun a new job as a bank teller, I believe in the World Trade Center, and this happened to her. So we try, um, as soon as Black Women Unmuted became functional, <laughs> we um, posted her on our social as our 9-11 our remembrance. 
And it is one of the most popular posts that we've ever had. So we make a point to never forget her, never forget her name and the sacrifice um, that she endured because she also suffered with PTSD, struggled with her health. It just seemed as if there was a downward spiral from 9-11 until her life ended. And, and I simply pray that her story remains relevant and out there and people will always remember her name. And Clem, you um, you mentioned seeing her, but I know that you've also encountered a number of people who've had health effects related to 9-11. And that's a huge thing that we have to pay attention to is our environmental health from the places where we, are, we live and what we're exposed to on a daily basis, not just in a tragedy, but on a day, daily basis. Clem, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I have, I have a ESU cop friend who he was on 60 Minutes, in fact, I think about uh, three or four years ago, they, they had the 60 Minutes special talking about folks who had survived and the kinds of health issues they, they're dealing with. And I'm telling you, I mean, Rudy Giuliani and Christine and, and, and um, Governor um, um, Tristy Todd Whitman of New Jersey, they sent us a lot of people to death when they walked down that thing without... Um, you know, remember them when they went to Ground Zero without a mask on, without without their thing, and they're walking. Oh well, America's going to come back. Like but those guys who stayed down there, I mean, huh, you 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 don't want. I mean, the, when you hear some of the stuff, I mean, the the, the sinuses are gone and had to be had to be removed. The heart problems, the digestive problems, the the GERD, the the back problems. I mean, there's it's 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 a it's an ongoing thing, and and as you said. We need to check, run some of these people down because there's a lot of folks of color, particularly the cooks, the maids, the busboys, the folks who ran like everybody else, the folks who all oh, they you know they're not the the, the high powered lawyer up on the 89th floor who was doing all this stuff. This is the guy who was you know pushing the carts and and, and uh, through delivering mail. These people are now suffering, and I'm and I'm just shocked that I to see that picture. I'm telling you that took me back because I remember that woman walking, I think, I, I, I'm pretty sure it was her because she walked across the Brooklyn Bridge and I remember she's striking. You can't, you see her in a crowd. She's one of those people. You see her, as soon as you see her, you see her, no matter what else was around. And I just went, wow, look at that her. And the dust on her was just an inch thick everywhere. And she's just walking and everybody's just like in shock, you know, shell shock, shell shock, just walking, just walking like, and that's a long walk from the World Trade Center across yeah. the Brooklyn Bridge to, to, to Tillery Street. That's a long walk. So, and they're just walking, just, I'm gonna get home when I get home, but I'm gonna put one more foot in front of the other and I'm gonna get home. These stories need to be told. They're still there to be told. And that's what we do. We're storytellers. We need to tell them. Well, actually all you young journalists who are watching, you all need to tell these stories. It's Thank your you. turn, step up. Thank you, Clem, Thanks. for saying that because we do have some of our young journalists here. Uh, Keith Alexander is now um, our advisor to the Hilltop. Uh, Professor Sturgis and Lamb, we all work with our student um, organizations and outlets and they're all doing stories. So I'm glad you reminded them that this is now we're passing the gavel to them. Okay, um, so we said 15 more minutes, but it will go quickly, especially since there's six of you. So I wanted to give you an opportunity for um, final thoughts. Um, and a, as I mentioned earlier, any messages that you have for students who are in the audience any messages that you have for the general public, um, particularly as it pertains to journalism? And just final thoughts in general. I just wanted to say something real quick since young people are watching. You know, unfortunately, in those big stories and those clutch situations, you only get one shot. You only get one shot to prove yourself or one shot to fail. Um, and unfortunately, editors have a long memory. And when a big story happens, you've got to show up. And you've got to show out um, because unfortunately um, they won't see you again if you don't. They will not. They will look right past you in the newsroom if you don't show up and show out. Um, and it's it's it's, uh, it's unfair. You know you should you should be given a, given a second chance. It doesn't work that way in the newsroom, especially with big stories. Um, and so you really have to really roll up your sleeves and get in there and show that and, and get that story done and already working on the next story, already working on that second story. That's how you gotta prove yourself because we don't we don't get that second chance. Others do, we don't. I'm done. And it starts now, and it, it starts, starts now. now. Okay. Uh, I would say, uh, if I may, I would say that 
it's so crucial to put faces, human faces, onto um, any any tragedy. But um, specifically, because we are so often left out, the stories of Black people are always going to be important because they are the ones that are the ones who need to be comforted. And remember, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Um, we are the ones who are so often the afflicted. And um, like the young lady said, we were all under attack that day. But the ones who um, got the least attention, et cetera, et cetera, is usually, usually us. Um, finally, I would say that um, we must take care of ourselves. I think that's one big thing that's come out of this conversation. Uh, I happen to also be an ordained minister, so that has helped me, my prayer life has helped me through these moments, these great moments when well, I was called, like I said, the inward to my face and um, having to cover all of the, you know, an electrocution and all that kind of stuff. And everything from a black perspective can be very, very painful. And so whatever it takes for you, then um, then do that thing, you know, take a weekend vacation, make sure that you're resting your mind because the editors will be like, go, go, go. And then 20 years later, or, you know, like now I'm feeling sensations that I never felt before by just this night of remembrance. And thank you, Howard, for, uh, for allowing this. Thank you, whoever's idea this was, it was, it was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. As we also always like to say, for you to work hard and play hard and take care of your mind, body, and soul. Yes. Okay. And who wants to go next? Well, I'd just say um, uh, uh, to the students who are watching, listen, the, the, you know, the biggest, the greatest trick about starting your career, ask questions, not just outside the newsroom, in the newsroom. Ask the person with that good story, how'd you get that? Ask the person who told that great story, wow, study that cadence, study those verbs, study those nouns, see how that story is put together, see the importance of what's first, what's second, what's third, what's fourth, and ask them how they just ask questions everywhere and you'll grow, you'll get better, and the better you get, yes, the, the, you know, the, 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 it's a different time. Of the, I think it's not, well, I was in newspapers and you know, they, they made them around anymore, so we don't talk about it. But, but I think it is changing. This isn't America in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, right? This is 2021. And that's one of the problems that the Republicans are having is they still think it's um, America in 1970 and Barry Goldwater is running for president. And uh, you, you, you know, you can do this in this business. You can have a voice in this business. Your color is not as much of a factor. Your skills are the factor. Your skills will tell on you. Develop your skills voraciously. Work hard at it and it pays off. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if Melanie is still with us. I know she had some connection issues. I don't see her. I think she, she, had, to, she had to leave. She had to leave. Okay. Right. She had to go. Okay. Had to go. Sonia, you want to go next? Um, uh, for the young people, I would say, first of all, thank you for choosing this profession. We need you desperately. And if I had to impart advice to get you going on what you do, there are two things that will make you golden beyond asking questions. Two things that you should always do. Um, the first is follow up. You'd be surprised how many people just... The second is when you pitch your stories, give them the story. Don't just give an idea, give them the story they're more likely to accept what you offer mm. if you can give them a whole story or as close to a whole story as possible. So do those things, follow up. When you pitch a story, have that story. Don't ask for permission, say, hey, can I do this story? And then go out to do the story. Have that story already reported by the time you, <laughs> by the time you tell somebody you wanna do it. I did that often and it worked. So that's what I would say. Thank you. And oh, so can I just add one more thing? Because oh, somebody actually mentioned this real quick. 
develop a beat, learn a beat, learn something that you become an expert at. You know, for me, I, I, I covered airlines. I, I was the expert on the airline industry, so they had to keep coming to me. Find something, whether it's health, whether it's politics, whether, whether find something where you become the expert as a journalist so that your expertise comes through in your reporting and your writing. That's really why I was one of the lead writers on the business desk during 9-11, because I was an expert on the airline industry. So start now, find something that you're interested in to become, and so you can become a specialist in that area, and that will make you shine as a journalist. Sorry. Thank you. And Jennifer? Yes, I, I would just like to uh, leave for our young journalists. So at, at the beginning of the semester, my capstone class, I always share my uh, quote. I came up with a quote for journalism and I, I asked them, challenge them to come up with one for themselves to see what it is that motivates you. So mine is that journalists are the defenders of democracy, freedom fighters of the First Amendment and savvy and sophisticated storytellers. And I want to just encourage our students to be that storyteller, tell the story that has not been told. You've already heard, ask those questions. I also wanna remind them to stand out for the right reasons. You know, We all can tell our stories about those students that stood out for the wrong ones and just operate uh, with excellence without excuse uh, and don't give up. That's Thank my advice. Okay. Any, any final words for the, um, for the public or some members of the community who are with us? Um, I think that you can hear from this great panel that we had that they're really dedicated to telling these stories and it's really important, but there's been a lot of misinformation and disinformation and trashing of journalism in recent years. And we just really want to thank you for your support and remind you how vital what we do is. And we need you to lift your voices as well for this, when you see things that you like, as well as when you see things that you don't like, because it matters, your voice really matters. And, um, and know that you're getting the truth, especially when you're getting it from us. We're all in the truth business. Did anybody else want to add anything to that? Did Professor Sturgis, our department chair, she want to add anything? Um, well, I have one thing for um, young journalists, and that thing is to hear what people have to say about your work. And don't always be um, offended when someone tries to improve it or tries to work with you on it, because we're not all perfect when we come out the gate. And sometimes we have to take the criticism in order to get to the best work of our lives. And so my one thing is just being open to hearing what people have to say honestly and critically about what it is that you're doing so that you can get better. Thank you. I wanna thank your our panelists today for your contributions and telling the story and for reliving this experience with us. And I see that our Dean is here, Gracie Lawson Borders. So I would like to give her an opportunity to say something as well. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, uh, Yannick. Uh, what I was gonna to say to all the panelists is thank you, thank you. This has been um, riveting and so important for you to share for people to hear. And in a recent interview I had with someone, I said, overwhelm them with the truth. And that is what I say to the young people who are listening to you, overwhelm them with the truth. That is their charge. You need them to pick up the gauntlet and continue the work that you're doing. The community needs to challenge media to make sure that voices and representations of African-Americans and other people of color are there. So I'd like to thank you all and leave everyone with the overwhelm them with the truth. Thank you, Dean. And thanks to our audience for joining us today. We really appreciate your participation and your great questions. Everyone have a great week and continue to do the thank best you. you can and be the best that you can be. Thank you. Be blessed, not stressed. <laughs> thank you. Professor, any uh, student had asked if you could stay on. I don't know if you saw that. I did. I gave her my phone number so oh, she okay. can call me, but I'm willing to stay on too. Okay. Thanks, well, everyone. Thank, thank you, Dean. I didn't thank see Thank you for the invite. Here. Great thank seeing you. you. We'll stay close. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we got to catch up one time because you got a lot to tell me about what's going on with you. Take care, y'all. Yeah, take care. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.